Hey everybody, Lena Washington and Sean Cunningham back with you to talk about the Sacramento Kings and boy do we have a lot to talk about. Not only are the Kings leaving the Orlando bubble with a 3-5 and five record, first or second team eliminated from playoff contention when you look at it, uh, and since the recording of our last video, the general manager, Vladi Divac, has stepped down. And 24 hours after that news broke, assistant general manager, Pedro Stryakovic, has stepped down. So a lot of ground to cover, Sean. We've got a couple bullet points, but I'm just wondering, I mean, where do we even start here? <laughs> How do we even begin to cover everything that's transpired? You know, it's funny. When Vladi Divac first came to Sacramento, he was inheriting a chaotic situation back in what 2015 or whenever he officially became took his title and as he's leaving it's kind of chaotic again you know that old saying that you want to leave a job better than you found it uh, i don't know that it's entirely better than they found it but certainly uh, it hasn't gone well uh, fans are frustrated people within the organization are obviously frustrated and yeah it's going to be a new day um in, a, in an off season, that's going to be extremely, extremely important. I know we say that every single year and, you know, it's easy to say when you've had 14 losing seasons, 14 straight losing seasons, but how about eight winning records in 35 years of Kings basketball in Sacramento? Yeah. When you put it that way, it's, it's a tough pill to swallow for a lot of fans. And at this point, a lot of media members, uh, and we've got so many things to talk about first being, I feel like the, the next era in Kings basketball that, that we're going to see with the, uh, I won't say it's cleaning house necessarily, but two major moves at the top. Um, and I feel like that has been, you mentioned the fans, one of the, I guess, you know, things that they look to, to, uh, to point to the, uh, I guess, lack of success when it comes to this team, right? So, I'm wondering if you can kind of break down how we got to this moment. And, and you and I have, have obviously covered this team closely, but for those who might be outside of the realm of what we see here in Sacramento, um, can you put into perspective what this move means, especially when it, we're talking about Vladi Divac, a legend in Sacramento? Yeah, a guy who's, you know, his jersey hangs from the rafters. He has quite a legacy. And I've been asked that question a lot is, you know, his, his, his time as general manager and the failures that he has as a general manager hurt his legacy. And it shouldn't. I think in the immediate term, yeah, it, it will. Um, even when he took over the job, he set the franchise back with that trade with Philadelphia, uh, losing first round picks and, and the like. So, um, yeah, there were problems right off the bat. He set the franchise back. Uh, but he was learning on the job, and I think that was kind of understood, which was uh, a general manager with no experience taking over and I think ultimately, you know, people will point to drafts, not, you know, obviously Luka Doncic looks like an absolute superstar and we've only seen Marvin Bagley in 13 games in his second season. So uh, certainly that's going to resonate as well. But um, I think when you look at the timeline, it's important because fans will point to that draft a lot and rightfully so. I mean, it, it looks like, you know, Luka's a once in a generational superstar at the moment, but um, it was April of 2019, just last year, when even with that having already happened, that drafting of Bagley over Doncic and Jaron Jackson Jr. and Trey Young, um, Vladi was rewarded with a four-year contract extension. So what happened between now and then? Well, you finished the season under Dave Yeager with 39 wins, the most you'd had since Rick Adelman. You fire Dave Yeager because you're not going to extend him. You bring in Luke Walton. You don't interview anyone else because Luke Walton is, is let's face it, who Vladi wanted even before Dave Yeager. And you went into a season where ownership made it very, very clear that playoffs are the expectation this year. Uh, that's hard to do under a first-year head coach, especially given the injuries and the pandemic. Uh, but I can tell you this much. We know that Vladi Divac uh, came back from Orlando after experiencing what happened in the bubble, fully anticipating staying on as general manager and seeing this thing through. And as he comes back, he's conducting – Exit interviews, he's notified by Vivek Ranadive that they want to make the switch. Joe Dumars, who's been an advisor with this team, kind of a present presence within the organization for the past year or so, even though he lives in SoCal. And, you know, the guy, come, they're going to ultimately give him control, and Vladi didn't want anything to do with that. Sat on it for a little bit and then ultimately decided, you know what, this just isn't for me. If you've already lost your faith in me after a year, uh, when really not a whole lot has changed since then. Um, 
he, he steps down. So he's going to get all his money. He's going to get paid out. And I think that's important to note, especially with the way money and business is within, you know, COVID-19 pandemic. And so now we're looking at Joe Dumars, at least in the interim, but from my understanding, it sounds like Joe Dumars is going to be overseeing this operation for a while. And as everyone's pointed out that he's going to be tasked with hiring a general manager. Well, don't be surprised if that doesn't happen this year. Uh, I mean, if, if he goes the entire year without hiring a general manager, I would blame that on the truncated offseason. The draft is, you know, we're already playoffs are, are abound. The Kings aren't a part of that. And they've got a lot of pieces and, and dra- they've got to get ready for the draft. You just saw Pedro Stojakovic step down. Uh, he's worked with Ken Catanella in Detroit um, when as an assistant GM. So he has that familiarity. But I don't think they're going to rush to to hire a GM right away. I think it's possible, certainly possible because of Dumar's um, experience as a general manager in Detroit that he might get through the off get through this off season and into next season without a general manager in place. I don't think that's ideal, but I think it's certainly possible. Yes, I, I, and I also believe it's important to note that the two remaining uh, assistant general managers or an interim general manager, so to speak, have worked together in the past and has seen success. I mean, Joe Dumars is also a Hall of Famer and he has won executive of the year. He's won championship. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, what is the likelihood that we even get a new general manager altogether? Or could this be a, a landing spot for, for Joe Dumars permanently? Yeah, I think, I think it could be a landing spot for him permanently. Um, uh, you know, at least for him to oversee the basketball operations, I think he will eventually hire that general manager. It's just, when will that happen? And I think and when he's looking around the league at people that could be available, either people within organizations who have experience, maybe a, possible, uh, uh, a former agent, as seems to be a trend within the NBA. Bob Myers is probably the, the gold standard of that in Golden State with the Warriors, who was a former agent and turned a general manager. But he's also, if, if, Joe, if Joe Dumars wants to do this and remain in place with the Kings, overseeing the entire organization, he's hiring a GM who ultimately doesn't have that control of running the ship. So that is possible to find, but obviously some people would rather have the entire control themselves. Who knows what that looks like? Who knows? That we ha- and the, the tragedy is we, Joe Dumars has been with this organization for a year and outside of, hey, Mr. Dumars, how are you? That's the extent of conversations we've had with the guy. So, um, it'll be interesting to see if he really wants to do this again. And, and it, look, if people are excited about the change, I understand that, but it's not an exact science. I mean, guys, gen, good general managers make mistakes. Joe Dumars is certainly one of them, you know, famously drafting the likes of Darko Milicic over Carmelo Anthony. So we all know how that turned out, but the guy did put together a championship type team. So um, he has a, a, a good track record. He's obviously got some warts there. But it's all on Joe Dumars. As long as he wants to do this and find someone that will work hand in hand with him under him. And then, oh, by the way, what do you do with your head coach? Because they did not hire him. Right. And I believe a lot of people are looking at all the moves that are happening and questioning if Luke Walton is safe. I believe that they will continue to have him as their head coach going into next season. I, again, you mentioned the truncated offseason, all of the decisions that they have to make from the draft to. The, the list of undrafted or excuse me unrestricted or restricted free agents that they have coming up this summer um, and trying to make that decision while finding the chemistry and the and the uh, I guess communication that we saw was difficult even for these for these guys to establish with Luke Bolton going into the beginning of the season before they had to, they went to India and we saw how that looked the very first time they went into competitive basketball on the floor. Um, but I think it's it's going to be an eventful off season. That's for sure. It's already gotten off and popping. <laughs> you know, not even uh, 24 hours after they touched down back in Sacramento. Um, I think it's also worth noting that you know on the other side, the Pelicans have also dismissed Alvin Gentry of his yeah. duties as head coach after five seasons. And again, those were the first two teams eliminated from playoff contention. One had a lot of expectations, were favored to make it into the eighth seed or at least a play-in game, and the Kings were just kind of forgotten, truly. And they were still, again, tied with the Pelicans and Portland in terms of record and games back, and they just could not deliver in the way that we've seen the likes of Dane Dalla and Yusuf Nurkic and the Portland Trailblazers deliver to secure the eighth seed, snatching it away from the Grizzlies. Um, but as we mentioned, a lot of free agents – up uh, this summer of note, Kent Bazemore, Bogdan Bogdanovich, Harry Giles, Corey Brewer, Alex Len, 
Yogi Ferrell. So you look at that, I think the most, uh, the most attention is going to Harry Giles, especially after what we saw from him in Orlando, particularly against the Magic and the Pelicans. They, we didn't see much from him in his final game against the Lakers, four points in four minutes. But what do you see this team doing to provide any kind of continuity to what they found this season and they found a bit of success. They had a burst of success, but they obviously could not maintain that. So how do you find that with the decisions that you have to make in trying to maintain the chemistry of the team? Yeah, that's something that, you know, no matter what, whether it's Joe Dumars or he does get a general manager in place. I mean, we mentioned Luke Walton and the decision having to be made there. And, and before I go forward with that, I will say, you know, a general, you want the general manager hired the, the coach. I mean, that's what you want. And let's not forget what happened with Luke Walton in the bubble. He lost his lead assistant uh, who went off to a different opportunity in Turkey. So, um, you know, you would think that you're, that if Luke Walton is going to continue on, you're going to afford him the opportunity to, to sign a lead assistant coach. Remember, if you go back to in back to last fall, when he took over, um, he famously wanted Brian Shaw. Uh, Brian Shaw was not going to, the money wasn't going to match up and he wasn't going to be able to bring in Brian Shaw. He ends up with Igor Kokoskov in the, in the interim or well in, in replacement. And then Igor goes off. So you, you kind of want to have Luke, if you're going to have Luke, you need to have, give him the full support. And in doing so, if you're not going to get rid of Luke and he's not your coach, well then, and you're only holding on to him to see what happens in this year that can be pretty dangerous because as a GM, whoever they hire, or if it's Dumars who's by himself, you're really kind of throwing away one year of life, right? Just to see if something works. And I know this is odd circumstances business-wise because you don't want to add money that you don't need. You, you know, companies are bleeding money. I understand that. But if you keep Luke, you're going to likely have to hire an assistant. And if you don't, then that just shows that you don't have any faith in Luke at whatsoever. And if you do hire an assistant coach, it's going to, someone like you, a lot of people have speculated Alvin Gentry, as you mentioned just a minute ago, if Alvin Gentry and Luke re-team like they were in the Warriors uh, under Steve Kerr, well, Alvin Gentry's got NBA head coaching experience. He's, he's not going to come cheap. If you think Brian Shaw was expensive, how much do you think Alvin Gentry's going to cost? And then, oh, by the way, you've got to probably put Alvin Gentry's contract and line it up with Luke in terms of length of term. So at a million and a half, if we're being generous over another three years, I mean, that's over $3 million. I'm not great at math, but it's over $3 million when you already owe Luke some money. And if he's not your coach going forward, there's a decision that has to be made there. So I think they really need to figure that out first and foremost, because they do have time before free agency. The, you mentioned free agency. Yeah, I think Giles is a, is a big part of it. But I think the biggest thing, the bigger no-brainer is, is – you obviously have a contract extension due to De'Aaron Fox. That's something that has a deadline of October 30th, if I'm not mistaken, or November 30th. That's the date. That's the date. November 30th is the date to get an extension to De'Aaron Fox, which means he's going to be making $25 million a year. That's just the way it is. Jamal Murray is the one you can really point to in Denver last year who signed a five-year deal max. He got everything he got, and that's, the, that's what De'Aaron Fox's crew is going to want. They're going to want a similar contract that's going to give him that much money. Most people would probably say that's a no brainer, but look, knowing what you've already done with Harrison Barnes, Buddy Heald, you've got some big money tied end up to this team. And then you have a decision to make about Bogdan Bogdanovich, who you offered four years, $50 million to on a qualifying sheet before the season started that he turned down because he wanted to be, he wanted to test free agency. Well, luckily you've got control there. He is restricted. You can match any offer. There's not a lot of teams that are under the salary cap, but given the Kings financial constraints, it could be hard to keep Bogdan Bogdanovich. But if you do, that's going to be more money tied into him. And if you don't keep him, you need to get something for him. So hopefully you can facilitate some sort of sign and trade. And I think there is a decision like it or not, the money that they gave Buddy Heald, which oh, by the way, jumps up to $24 million this coming season. Um, you, you almost kind of have to have Bogey and Buddy and figure it out. The other option is maybe Bogdan Bogdanovich sticks around for the one year signs the qualifying sheet for $10 million this next season, and then becomes an unrestricted free agent the following year. I think Kings fans would love to see that. I think Joe Dumars would love to see that. But then, yeah, you mentioned you've got Harry Giles. You have, non, you have money that's not guaranteed to Nemanja Bialica that you could likely uh, 
part ways with if, if need be. There's going to be some tough, tough decisions. Camp Bay is more one of them. I think the one thing that they, that they work with, with, with Harry Giles is the fact that they can offer him years, a longer term. But I think Harry Giles has shown a lot of people that he's got some promise, uh, that he's not necessarily a bust, and it's a very low-risk, high-reward type situation that a lot of teams would be ready to invest in that sadly one of Vladdy's biggest downfalls was he wasn't. And even with all that said, I'm curious, do you see this roster being shaken up in a, in a noticeable way come the restart of the upcoming season? I mean, I think it's, I think it's possible because they – look, the, I think the, the biggest things that the Kings have going for them is obviously De'Aaron Fox, is obviously, like it or not, Buddy Heald is part of that, even despite his struggles. Um, you know, we've seen what it looks like when Buddy Heald plays well and this team do well. Um, he obviously has been crippled mentally with what's gone, with what's happened this year uh, under Luke Walton. Maybe another head coach does him well. Maybe another year of Luke Walton helps. Maybe Luke sees a different side of him. Maybe the roster looks a little bit different. But those two are te- technically your cornerstones, right? You get a, another year under Marvin Bagley. Hopefully he stays healthy. We see what, what that looks like. But you've got all of your first round picks, which you shouldn't probably deal um, given the, 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 the setup that you have cap wise uh, keep, those are your biggest assets. Uh, but in this draft alone, a lottery pick, you know, three third round picks that maybe you can ship off, get some, who knows. Um, yeah. I think, I think it's very possible every year. Look, you still have your full mid-level exception, which is right around nine and a half million dollars. You still have your biannual extension or exception, which is right around, three, four, five million dollars. Um, so you do have things, pieces you can add, but there's going to be really tough decisions made. And I think we've kind of identified some of those with, you know, what happens with Bogey, what happens with Bielitsa, what happens with Harry Giles, and what happens with even Buddy Heald and, and going forward, even though he's under contract. And look, Harrison Barnes is a is is a big contract that's almost unmovable. Maybe you try to see if you can make any wiggle room there, but um, they're going to look at all. And, and that's the that's the tough part when when Joe Dumars sits down and, and looks at a general manager, and if you're a general manager that wants the opportunity, granted, this is one of 30 jobs, you come in here and you look at all those roadblocks and hurdles and challenges that are in your way, and oh, by the way, you're in Sacramento and you're not running the show. That could be, those could be those things that they, that they have that are part of the evaluation process that could be tough to overcome. Absolutely. I think there are so many various hurdles for the Kings to overcome to somehow write their franchises ship and and win more than 39 games for the first time in almost two decades if they go on to next season without a postseason appearance they will meet the clippers for the record of all time playoff drafts at 15 so how about, that? I, how about that and and the suns aren't far behind they're 10 seasons in but i will say they provided some extreme entertainment in the bubble and as a, a jaded Suns fan for the last several years I was happy to see for a moment that they were delivering and people were actually rooting for them and I'm always rooting for Monty Williams everything that he's had to overcome I mean you hear about how beloved he is around the league so uh you know that was a guy that was available last season before uh Luke Walton was hired in Sacramento uh just to throw that out there as well but uh, what was your take on the whole bubble experience so far, Sean? We're, we're about to get into the playoffs. We saw this incredible play-in game between the Grizzlies and the Trailblazers, and I'll be damned if Damian Lillard doesn't <laughs> make his way and force his way in somehow. He has willed his team to a postseason appearance. TJ McCollum was playing on a fractured back. Yusuf Nurkic was playing in the wake of his grandmother's passing due to COVID-19 in Bosnia. I mean, have we seen this level of competition? I feel like we have been parched of this kind of this kind of drama in the league, and, and they delivered. I feel like no, it's been great. I mean, even even if you take them aside and you look at just the way you mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, you mentioned your sons. There were so many close games. It wasn't even the sons. I mean, just every game for the most part was super competitive. Was really good. Now, obviously, Kings fans didn't get a lot of that, but um, you're seeing some just high level basketball. Uh, I think the level of competition was was one of the biggest things that surprised me throughout all teams. You look at that that Portland game you mentioned, especially against the Brooklyn Nets, for them to clinch that to, to solidify that spot was unbelievable. An unbelievable that was probably the best game I saw the, in the entire time in the bubble. Um, Portland has been in so many of those games, and 
you know, I can't help to bring it back to a Sacramento level. If you're, if you're a Kings fan, watching every one of these games has to kind of sting. There's always a reminder of somebody you missed on. Damian Lillard, probably chief among them. Gary Trent Jr., another one of them. Look, you could have even drafted C.J. McCollum. He came through uh, Sacramento with a pre-draft workout. Zach Collins. I mean, these are all on Portland. Zach Collins, Hassan Whiteside. All these guys that are former Kings or had a connection to a King or the Kings just passed on them or traded them. Um, it, it, it can be tough. And, and look, there's, there's guys like that on almost every team. Chief among them, look at, look at Denver and Michael Malone as a head coach. So uh, <laughs> it's got to sting. But it, it, at the same time, um, I'm, I'm thrilled for these playoffs. I, I can't wait for this 1-8 matchup. When's the last time we could say that? Uh, the Sonics and maybe Dikembe Mutombo's Denver Nuggets. I mean, this is, this is, this is going to be a fun matchup. I think everyone has been wanting to see uh, Dame go up against this Laker team that's honestly haven't, hasn't played that well. I mean, we've seen that. Like, you know, they've struggled defensively. LeBron is starting to, you know, I hate saying that because I never want to doubt LeBron, but it, it's almost like at 35, maybe it's like right here now on the tail end a little, just a little bit. Uh, maybe that happened a year ago. Who knows? But uh, I, I just I, I think there's so many intriguing possibilities. Dallas has played so well. Um, you know, Nikola Jokic looks really, really good for Denver. That's one that stands out. And then look at the East. I mean, the Bucks. I mean, they're good, but I think they're beatable. So, the way Orlando has played, the way Brooklyn has played, has certainly been encouraging. Gosh, I, there's so many intriguing matchups that, that I, I really can't wait. And Toronto just keeps, I, 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 you know, not to, not to ramble here, but Toronto just keeps on keeping on. And Nick Nurse has done a hell of a job. Uh, it's a total team effort there. They lose Kawhi Leonard. And look, they're still one of the top teams in the Eastern Conference and could probably take down the box. Yeah, I, I, I've been thoroughly entertained with all of the games. I will say I've been disappointed because the Suns were only featured on national television twice, one of which was their final game, which, as we know, they won, but it ultimately didn't matter because and they, Damian and they, Lillard is a god. So. Yeah. <laughs> and they flexed that game. You know, that wasn't originally scheduled. They had to be like, oh, oh this, yeah, this is a game that matters. We need to put this on. <laughs> yes, great decision in the, in the programming department. Uh, but I, I believe... If we get a play-in format, I'm I'm in for it. I don't know if it's a necessarily a, a games back situation or a straight you're, up. You're saying situation. long term. You would want to see that long term. I think it, it builds the competition, right? It prevents people from just slacking off and, and resting players, and it builds some kind of anticipation for the playoffs, so that. I, I feel like it could be interesting. It could be I think, very interesting. I, th I think we're just blinded by what's happened in the bubble. Because, I mean, let's be honest, this isn't baseball where all of a sudden they're opening up to other, you know, other team, other, to, have, to almost have what the NBA has now, which is half of the league make the playoffs. I mean, think about that. You have half the teams make the playoffs in the NBA. And even, you know, the, the discussion of maybe you break up the Eastern and Western conferences, combine them, and then take the top teams. You know, I think as much as I, as a traditional, I don't want, really want to see that happen myself. I would love that. I, I, I will go on the record yeah. and say I'm, I'm here for the 116 seating. Yeah, and, and I will say I'm much more in favor of that than I am of seeing another play-in game. I think the play-in game made sense, be, and, it, and it, proved out, it proved out in the bubble because of the log jam that you had and you didn't have a full 82 game schedule because of this pandemic. So um, given those circumstances, I'm okay with it. This was the year to try it much like baseball is being gimmicky with, you know, extra inning rules and putting a runner on second and various little nuances in the game to try to speed it up. Look, I get it. This is the year to try it. I don't know that I'm in favor of seeing a nine, eight play in game scenario in either conference going forward though. That's just me. I just don't think wow. if you have half the teams making the playoff, like you said, it leads to maybe teams not resting as much. I actually disagree. I think it's like you got a team that, okay, well, we look, we still know we'll make the playoffs. We're still good enough to make the playoffs. We'll still have an opportunity for some of those teams because the distance between a top five in either conference and the bottom five in most in, in that conference is mo more times than not pretty, pretty vast. Like there's usually a good separation there. The crazy, right, like but he, there's, yeah. I feel like there's always a, a log jam between six and ten, even at least in the West. I feel like that's been the trend for the last several years. So, yeah. and it's to me, it's not fair to reward a team that's has seven less wins or eight less wins in the Eastern Conference. They're getting an eight seed while teams are 
not even making it in and they could be more exciting and they're more obviously primed and ready to go for some kind of postseason action. So whether it's a yeah. play-in game or a change in all ultimate seating, uh, I'm going to let you finish, but I'm going I'm to let it – let the record reflect that I'm I'm up for a shakeup in the postseason. No, and and again, look, I'm much more I'm much more open to that than than the other. Um, I still can't wrap my head around. I mean, we haven't even mentioned what the midseason tournament would look like with 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 that kind of being kicked around. And I, who knows, maybe that's kind of on the, on the back burner on ice now that we have this pandemic and a shortened season um, likely coming on the horizon for next year. If it all starts in December, is is kind of penciled in is what they're kind of thinking would would work, but um and, and likely i mean is that in the bubble scenario what that look like so i don't know i don't know if they're gonna if they might want to try that mid-season tournament next year or not i think they were kind of it was an idea that certainly gained momentum and i think a lot of people were behind it i wasn't one of them um because i do think the answer is not to take a look either way you do it you're still putting a tournament together to gain interest in the league and it, where, where i think your league is already doing fine it's unfortunate, however, that because of the NFL and baseball playoffs that most people don't, the average fan doesn't pay attention to the NBA until right around Christmas. Um, and then you could even argue maybe not till the playoffs. So um, I, I think maybe it's a restructuring of the season. I don't think a midseason tournament helps, but, you know, hey, the NBA is, is I like it. It's a progressive league. They're, they're willing to take some chances, but you, it's not, it's not a broken system. It really isn't. It is not, but yes, they are progressive. They are forward thinking and uh, there are a lot of ideas that they've been kicking around in, in owners meetings and whatnot. Um, real quickly on LeBron, I will say I was surprised, shocked that he actually started against the Kings in their final game. But I guess that speaks to, again, the, the little trouble in paradise over in LA. And I said, you know, <laughs> I bet Dame Dalla is just rubbing his hands, looking at coups over in the cafeteria at Walt Disney World, because I don't think that the Lakers having the, first, the number one seed keeps them safe from this team, the way that they've been playing, and with the hunger that you know that they have. We'll see if they actually are able to deliver on that, because as we've seen between sweeps and various series, we don't see the same Portland team, I should say, in the postseason, but maybe this this environment the scenario the the stakes might be a little bit higher and more in in their favor when they face this, this lakers team yeah and when it comes to lebron i kind of i kind of agree but i'm gonna speak out of both sides of my mouth because um lebron at 35 with the number one seed and guys that were already resting and 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 acknowledging some of the problems they had we get it but that was textbook lebron like lebron doesn't sit out games he just doesn't you know he's always competing he's never suffered that big injury I think he you know much like uh the superstition of the game you don't cheat the game I think he ultimately believes in that type of karma and uh I you know he knew he was going to play the first half go out there and give it a good effort um he had some comical moments uh <laughs> that were you know a missed layup a missed alley-oop things you just there you don't really see it for LeBron uh, so not having him play that that second half made sense but you're right I mean he's it's, it's just a guy who knows that his place in in the league and and had that had been a game like in Sacramento as a season finale where people pay money to see LeBron he absolutely would have played that game he, he would have he wouldn't have sat out and that that's some of the stuff that's very that he's very aware of, which is when he goes to an arena, people come to see him and, you know, that might be the one time all year they've come to see him might be the only time in their life that they're able to see him because, you know, ticket prices are usually jacked up when LeBron is involved. So he's very, very aware of that. So it didn't surprise me, but being that there's no fans in this, in this environment. Yeah. Yeah. It did kind of surprise me a little bit because he had every excuse not to play. Uh, but obviously they had things to work on. So uh, surprising, not surprising, both at the same time. Absolutely. Well, I think what is not surprising for most Sacramento Kings fans is they will not be partaking in the postseason, which you'll be able to catch plenty of games on ABC. Uh, and be sure to tune in to Toyota Sports Extra, all our fans in Sacramento, Stockton, Modesto, the surrounding areas. They are back after a nearly five-month hiatus. So if you're able to set your DVRs or tune in live on Sundays at 1135, you will see our new set that is uh, uh, outside of our new studio, but we are making it work. And since sports are back, so are we. So, will, our, uh, will our new uh, will our new coworkers Jiminy will he will they will he make it? 
Jiminy and all of his friends will be there. <laughs> all of all of his cricket friends will be tuning in and and giving us some moral support from inside the ABC 10 garage where we will be reporting live from. And we hope you guys can join us. So. And, it, and they've kept it remarkably cool. I, I'm still blown away by that. Like it's, it's blazing hot outside here in Sacramento. We're in this heat wave right now. And in that garage, you would think it would be just sweltering. And they've been props to our engineering department and people at our station who've really taken care of us because it, you go in there and it, you, you don't really notice a huge difference. It's actually been rather uh, comfortable. Yeah, it's not too bad with a, an AC and a swamp cooler and three or four fans in the building <laughs> that, we've, that we've turned into our, our personal workspace. So uh, we appreciate you guys tuning in. A lot of ground we covered on this uh, latest edition of King's Talk, but if anything else develops, in Sacramento, we've got you covered on abc10.com slash sports right here on the Hella Sports YouTube channel. Follow us at Washington TV, Sean Cunningham on Twitter and Instagram, and we will see you next time.